You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Busy 24 hours or so here in the IPO market. We got Astera Labs, that price last night at 36 indicating to open at 56, so that would be good for the IPO market. And then we've also got Reddit mm-hmm. uh, looking to price tonight, and we saw some Bloomberg reporting earlier today that says they are considering the high end or perhaps even above it, uh, above the range. So let's break it all down with Bailey Lipschultz. He covers uh, the equity markets, including the new issue markets. So Bailey, let's start with Astera Labs. Boy, if this were to open, at $56, again, after pricing at 36 that would be huge news for the IPO market. The even more interesting thing, this is an IPO that bumped up its range, increased the allocation and oh, number wow. of shares, and then priced above. So we're already talking about it pricing almost 26% so above midpoint. they weren't trying midpoint. for this kind of bump necessarily. No, th- and this huh. is a deal that everyone had circled. We are all talking about Reddit, but when I talk to bankers and investors, they say, Astera Labs, they're backed by Intel. They make AI chips. They are fit into every tailwind that you yeah. want in this market. That's the deal that you want to keep an eye on, and they're profitable. But they don't do the weight loss thing. They're but AI. They, okay. As far okay. as I know, yeah, you know. But maybe. they're profitable, which begs the question, is Reddit profitable? They are not. They've okay. been on the path to profitability, if you will. They talked up kind of the fact that they tighten spending, they have AI licensing, data licensing partnerships that really kind of bolstered numbers in 3Q, really 4Q of last year. But when you talk to investors and some of the skeptical analysts, the big question is, it's almost two decades old, it's not profitable, it operates in social media, which has its own flurry of issues. You look at Snapchat and Pinterest, who are the two best comps publicly traded, those stocks aren't doing too well. But if it does price at the top of the range, that'd be a $6.4 billion valuation. So a sharp haircut from the 10 billion it raised at in 2021, but still maybe a bit of a green shoot. It does remind me quite a bit of the Instacart IPO in the fall of last year, which, took a quote unquote down round, but right now is trading up about 23% from that IPO price despite some choppy aftermarket performance. So in Reddit, I also understand in addition to the advertising component, which again, we've seen before, as you mentioned with Pinterest and and, and others, um, Snapchat, uh, there's also a data component to it. And they're trying to tie it into a little bit of an AI situation, you can explain what that pitch is? Yeah, so I talked to one of the pitch book analysts who laid it out, I think, pretty easily. He said, basically, they're trying to license data for AI makers. So they have exactly what some of these AI companies want, which is engagement and human beings posting and talking to each other. He basically said, though, the question is, it's still in the early stages. Well, exactly, human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I talked to a number of uh, Wall Street Bets moderators about whether or not they're buying into the IPO. They were very much divided. But the big question for them, the bull case for these believers of Reddit, these Redditors, is that as as of now where we are in kind of the AI technology landscape, you need data, you need input, you need humans to create something. So that's one of the big kind of pitches from Reddit is that if you open up a partnership with Google or whoever and say, hey, here's the thousands and millions of people actively engaging with each other, do with it what you want. Though that does kind of raise questions for users and whether or not they would maybe taper off their usage. Well, well, also, yes. And also I was gonna say like, I've never been on Reddit. Do, do we want language models to, to, to know Reddit really? Like, do we like that relationship? <laughs> That's the big question. I mean, I, I lurk, so I don't, Alex, I don't have a Reddit account, but I do, you know. He lurks, I'm, he's totally I, a lurker. I lurk, you know. I, you're planning a trip, you kind of want to see what people recommend, or if you're looking to make a purchase, see what, what the forums are talking about. But I think even if you talk to Reddit users, a lot of their content is not safe for work. A lot of it is, shall we say, not family friendly, and they call each other a lot of names and taking. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I did go on Reddit. I I went down the Kate Middleton Reddit rabbit hole. Oh, okay. Did you find good content? No, I didn't know what to trust. I didn't know what was real. I got really confused and then I got scared and I left. But that's a great example of like what, what, what Reddit is. It sounds about right, yeah. yeah. And, and Reddit is built on uh, so-called karma points. So you get karma points when people upvote your comments or upvote your posts. Upvote? 
which is just basically Sounds liking. Up. It's liking, but mm. you can also dislike it. I actually, trying to get people to talk to me, said I was a Bloomberg reporter and wanted to talk about the IPO. Immediately had negative karma, like dozens of people <laughs> oh, just bashing me. That hurts, so, that hurts. Yeah, and, and then you can't comment. So then I couldn't comment anything. Oh. I couldn't respond to people because like, I had no, negative karma. no, I'm cool, karma. talk to me. Exactly, <laughs> and then, yeah, I got hit with the, some of the Steve Belushi uh, gifs and memes of like, hey, cool, fellow, fellow friends, like, <laughs> what's going on? Which, not. All right, how important are these two IPOs to the new issue market here. I mean, do we have a whole bunch backed up and we're just looking for some good karma in the IPO market? Um, how important are these two names here? They're, they're critical. And it's really because they both are in the tech space. They are what we would call kind of down the middle of the fairway IPOs in that 500 to a billion dollar raise in terms of cash being funded. Mm -hmm. You look at ARM and Amr Sports, those yep. are big deals. They're their own thing. The big thing though, when I talk to bankers is that at this point in time, the new issue market is going to be idiosyncratic. So the reason for Astera Labs going public is very different than the reason that Reddit's yep. going public. And they're, they're kind of trying to take or at least trying to read the signals from investors on who's willing to pay what multiple. But if these deals price as they are indicated and trade strongly, I definitely think, at least from my channel checks and conversations, that people will be drawn from the sidelines. Is it, do you think that these companies, and I appreciate they're all different companies, do they need the money to go do stuff? Is it a commentary on, wow, this market's awesome, let me get a piece of it? Or is it we need investors need to cash out or employees have shares and they need a vehicle? Like, what is the reasoning? A little bit of both. So you have in both cases, insider selling as part of the IPO. So trying to get some form of a return. But when you look at Astera Labs, taking those proceeds and being able to kind of bolster on their operations. Again, to your point, they're riding the AI wave. So if you can have Jensen Wang is filming a video for your road show, that's gonna get people excited. So why not go public now? Whereas Reddit, again, you look at the business, the evolution of the business on that path to profitability. It's been private, it's about 19 years old. So it's kind of due time for it to go public. Again, similar to Instacart. So they all kind of have their own reasons. But the big thing when you talk to investors and bankers, either profitability, path to profitability, or some form of unit economics. And that's been the big hmm. thing. And that's why we can see some of the more interesting names, I think, potentially going public in the next few weeks and months. Uh, some of those names that have been in the pipeline but also some that just have good, strong, fundamental businesses. I would think there'd be a lot of private equity sponsored deals mm. that would like to come, because we haven't seen a lot. Well, that was, Hummer Sports was essentially private equity, not necessarily. Bright Spring is just KKR back. That was a, a disaster of a deal and traded terribly. Um, that was, at least when I talked to some investors and strategists, was kind of, they just needed to get it out the door. Yep. But to your point, when you're, when you're a private equity company, uh, a private equity firm, you're kind of looking to recycle and get that fund of flows. We've had yep. the IPO market really frozen for a few years at this point. So it's really a question of, will they kind of cave on valuation and meet investors where they are? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of those assets are big, they aren't necessarily growing, and you need to get someone to at least buy the IPO. Will they? Do you think they will? I don't know. I think, again, it goes back to the whole case-by-case -case argument. Depends that on the company. The, company, depends, the, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the, the big thing is when you look at your comps. So if you're, again, an Astera Labs, Semiconductors, AI, perfect. Yep. If you're Reddit, a little bit tougher, again, because mm -hmm. Snapchat, Pinterest, but you're pitching that AI um, kind of part of the business and also trying to get more tied to a meta platforms. All right, Bailey. Yeah. Great stuff. Really, really great stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that you can be that excited about so many different companies going... <laughs> IPO and Bailey Lipschultz, a Bloomberg News IPO reporter joining us there. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The other news item out there, in addition to the Fed, one of the key ones is just kind of in the chip business. Got a couple of data points for you here today. Intel wins almost $20 billion in chips incentives for U.S. plants. That's good for Intel and the U.S. chip business. On the flip side, the U.S. weighs sanctioning Huawei's secretive Chinese chip network. Let's get the latest on kind of what's happening there. We're joined by Mackenzie Hawkins. Uh, she is a Bloomberg News U.S. industrial reporter. Mackenzie, thanks so much for joining us here. Let's start with Intel Hill here. I guess this is part of onshoring, you know, a lot of stuff on the U.S. soil, particularly on the chip side. Talk to us about this Intel story. Right. So today we saw the first preliminary term sheet for an advanced 
chip maker to come out of this broader U.S. effort to bring semiconductor manufacturing back to American soil. So Biden signed the CHIPS Act into law in August 2022. Companies have been waiting for you know, well over a year to see those funds start flowing out the door. They haven't actually flowed out the door yet. Intel's award today is just a preliminary agreement, and it will be likely until the end of this year that they start to actually see money doled out in tranches. But this is a huge investment in, you know, the real leading American chip maker. And I mean, these chips will power, you know, the AI frenzy. Mm -hmm. There are the types of chips that go into nuclear missiles and hypersonics. Um, This is a really significant investment for the company and for the states where they're building, um, including Arizona. Arizona, Ohio, um, Oregon, and New Mexico. So Mackenzie, pair this. So, okay, I, I, I love covering energy. So I'm really into the IRA. And like what, what we've seen a lot in the IRA is everyone got super excited, but then actually sort of putting shovels in the ground was a lot more difficult. So there's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to get the money. It's going to happen, but it's not happening quite yet. How do we think this plays out from the CHIPS Act? Like when does Intel put a shovel in the ground what other companies are trying to put their shovels in the ground and get the funding and will it actually you know happen so intel's already building these facilities they've had a 20 billion dollar arizona expansion underway for some time they're building multiple fabrication facilities there um, they're making some progress in ohio although there's been reporting that that's slightly delayed we expect that construction to finish in 2026 um, Intel's rivals, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company and Samsung out of South Korea, are also building plants in the U.S. Both of their sites have seen some delays that the companies and the Biden administration insist are in line with typical projections. Um, but time will tell on this one. It will be years before these facilities are stood up. The Commerce Department has set a goal that the U.S. will produce 20 percent of the world's advanced logic chips by the end of the decade. Currently, we're at about zero, um, so that's a lot of progress to catch up on. Most of that production is happening in East Asia. Um, the companies announced their projects before they got the funding from the federal government, but it is certainly their expectation that they will receive that funding, and they would like it to happen probably a little bit faster than it is. Hey, McKenzie, how secure is this funding over time? Uh, I'm thinking about we may have a new administration uh, in 2025. How secure is this funding, in, particularly you know, in the out years? Um, It's a great question. So today's announcement is a preliminary agreement. Um, Then there's a due diligence stage and then a final term sheet between Intel and the Commerce Department that will likely come closer to the time of the presidential election. And the Commerce Department is setting all types of benchmarks that Intel must meet for the money to be doled out over time. So it's not that they get the final agreement and then they get eight and a half billion dollars in grants and $11 billion worth of loans and loan guarantees. They have to meet benchmarks related to production, related to workforce development. And there are all types of requirements that Biden's Commerce Department might set that Mm -hmm. a potential Trump Commerce Department might not be as interested in. You've seen things like childcare facilities, which Intel and other companies have committed to, um, community development agreements, all those types of things. It's entirely possible that that could shift over time. But the reality is once they've got the equipment in the building, these are you know machines that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, they're committed to these facilities. Um, but Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger said just yesterday, we might need a chip back to 2.0. Um, these companies are vying for a lot more money um, than they currently have. The advanced chip makers together asked for more than double what the Commerce Department has available. Um, so this is really yeah. something to watch over the next couple of years and decades. I mean, is President Trump really gonna go to Ohio and Arizona and Oregon and New Mexico and be like, just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to take this development back. I mean, I think that's going to be a tricky proposition, considering it is so much money. Um, so I just came back, Mackenzie, from an uh, energy conference, basically, and I was just telling Paul that all the talk there was that t- tech companies are finally getting wise to the fact that they're going to build all this stuff. They need power, and that power isn't as easy to come by as they might have thought. Do you hear that at all on your industrial side? Like, hey, this is great. Build all these data centers, Intel. But like, who's going to pa- how are you going to get that power? What are you, what are you plugging in? Um, absolutely. Infrastructure is a top concern for these companies. You know, a big part of their ability to apply for chip tax funding is to demonstrate commercial viability and that they have buy in from state and local officials to marshal the resources necessary to Stand up factories that cost tens of billions of dollars to build, sometimes require entire new water pipelines or or energy resources. Um, You know, take Arizona, which has not just this massive Intel expansion, but also a huge factory, two factories under construction from TSMC. 
Arizona does 100 year water planning. This is a desert. And so they've had to very carefully plan their water development, ensure residents that their water supply is not going to be impacted. And I mean, down to the land parcel in Arizona, they've planned these industrial parks. Um, You see similar things happening in Indiana, which is expected to get a roughly $15 billion investment from SK Hynix, which is one of the main advanced packaging companies out of South Korea. That announcement hasn't been formally announced yet, um, but Bloomberg has reported on it. So, I mean, this is a massive infrastructural effort, which, as you note, is coming alongside a lot of other investments in other sectors stemming from the Inflation Reduction Act, things like EVs, batteries, hydrogen, wind, solar, um, and sort of more traditional hard infrastructure from the bipartisan infrastructure law. All right. More news, Mackenzie, on the uh, chip front, uh, which you're reporting as well. Well, you're all over this stuff. The U.S. weighs sanctioning Huawei's secretive Chinese chip network. Uh, This sounds like another round in what may be a technological cold war between China and the West. What's the latest here with Huawei? Certainly. So this is I would say the strongest potential U.S. reaction so far to a pretty significant breakthrough that Huawei had last August. Um, So Huawei has been the target of, you know, U.S. efforts to curtail China's tech development for years now. It was originally sanctioned in 2019. Um, The Biden administration, that was under Trump, the Biden administration followed up with sweeping export controls on the ability of U.S. companies and foreign companies that use U.S. technology to ship advanced ships and ship making equipment to China. And the goal was to cap uh, Huawei and other Chinese companies' chip development at what we consider an older generation or mature node. And then while the Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, was visiting China in August, Huawei unveiled a smartphone that was powered by an advanced 7 nanometer chip produced by their chip-making partner, SMIC, also a Chinese company. And a lot of people who've been watching the industry for a while say this isn't actually hugely surprising. Of course, China's doubling down on efforts to build a full domestic semiconductor supply chain. They figured out how to retool some older generation machines from the main Dutch equipment maker to produce these chips. But... A lot of folks in Washington were caught a little bit by surprise um, and have been working on a response. And so this is what the response could look like. There's a network um, that Bloomberg reported on last year. Um, the Semiconductor Industry Association, a Washington-based trade group, identified several companies that could potentially produce chips for Huawei in the future. And so this list of firms that Biden is considering sanctioning, meaning that any shipments to those companies would require a formal license from the Commerce Department, Mm -hmm. includes four companies that might make chips for Huawei and two companies that they're worried. These are not actual chip makers themselves, but they could import advanced equipment and then send that to Huawei or to Huawei's other yeah. making partners to continue producing these chips. Really great stuff. You are coming out all the time. Mackenzie yes, Hawkins, exactly. thank you so much. Bloomberg News, U.S. industrial uh, reporter. It's just the whole decoupling thing. Like, yeah, it's exactly. just really hard. It's going to take, take a, a lot of time. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Speaking of Boeing, I'm looking at the stock here. It's up about 1.8%, as Abigail suggested. So still down 29% year to date and off about 10% over trailing 12 months. So really some concerns there from investors. So let's check in with George Ferguson. He's the aerospace and airlines analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, he joins us uh, via uh, Zoom from Princeton. God forbid he gets on the train and comes to New York. But anyway, he's the best on the street. So we appreciate getting a few minutes of his time. George, you know, I I love Boeing. It's just a great American company. I love aerospace. But boy, these guys have just seems like every day something's happening here. Now, I guess it's partly the press is just picking up on any little thing. But uh, what's going on there with Boeing, really, do you think? Well, I mean, I think we heard it from Brian West this morning. He was in London at the Bank of America conference. And you know, besides, I think the cash flow guidance he provided, he provided few details about anything else. And so um, he describes a lot of processes, you know, processes at the FAA to get airplanes certified, processes in, in, in refining the manufacturing process, curing, you know, the excess outsourcing they've probably done over the last couple of decades. Um, so I think what, what you really get is a sense of a company that's in a state of a lot of flux. 
Um, and you know, I think that the markets have have shown us, you know, the the, the stock price sort of reflects that. Um, so George, does that mean we, so if the stock is up two percent, does that mean that it could have been worse? Like, is that my takeaway? Like that cash burn and the cash outflow could have been worse than four and a half billion? Well, that's my biggest takeaway from this was that you know. The market likes the fact that he talked about cash flow being positive by the end of the year. So it sounds like they've got a pretty nice ramp up in, uh, in, in you know, sort of resuming build rates at their factories across the year. That, that was better than what I expected. But again, the storyline inside the company is still one that's all about flux and not about details. Uh, so I just wonder, uh, I think I got a sense there's some risk in that, uh, in that cash flow projection. Yeah. So, George, you've covered Boeing for decades here. Can you recall a time when maybe they're, they've had these quality issues before? Is this, how unprecedented is these, you know, last couple of years, really? I think thoroughly unprecedented, right? So, um, even as I was leaving BlackRock, you know, the, when the, during the global financial crisis, I remember Boeing stock was down at $33 a share, pretty cheap than what it is today. Um, but... Uh, the discussion then was just about like a defense portfolio who products really weren't that modern, um, you know, and, and a angst about the company's future, but not these kind of problems uh, inside their manufacturing business, which is the core business of this company, right? Mm -hmm. It's an engineering and manufacturing company. If you can't manufacture things well in aerospace, that's a bad sign. So I, I don't think it's ever been this bad, ever. So just to recap, uh, today at a Bank of America conference in London, the CFO said the cash outflow is going to reach four to four and a half billion in the first quarter. Yep. Um, analysts yep. were looking for maybe five billion plus, And like you said, that maybe we'll get cash flow positive by the end of the year. That was the indication from Boeing. Do we believe, OK, that's not the right question. <laughs> How did they come up with this estimate? Like, what are the factors that go into this kind of estimate? That's exactly, we, we don't know, right? And so, so the, <laughs> it's all about deliveries. It's all okay. about deliveries of commercial airplanes. Uh, and so what I heard, you know, listening to it this morning, was I heard what I thought was we're going to be at rate 38 by the end of the year, which is the rate they should have probably built at all year long. And then we'll move to the next higher rate. That's 38 a month, sorry, on the 737. And we'll move to the next higher rate when the FAA lets us. So we'll publish tomorrow on the Bloomberg Terminal our view at Bloomberg Intelligence of what we think build rates were. I can tell you we have factored in a fourth quarter at rate 38, um, but it sounds like quarter one is going to be a really rough quarter, so they'll have to pull a lot of things back together to get rate back to 38 by the end of the year. But I think it's, it, it feels like everything has feasible. to go right. Yeah. For, 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 for that to happen, Paul. And as we know, that never happens. <laughs> that ne never happens. But uh, George, you've told us in the past, um, in the aerospace business, there is no, hey, we did a pretty good job on this plane. It has to be perfect every single uh, time. Otherwise, it's, it's disastrous. And they've, from the their customer's perspective, George, if I'm a big buyer like a Southwest or a United, what am I saying to these guys? I mean, I, I fly thousands of these planes every single day in, in my fleet. What am I telling Boeing these days? Yeah, so you're watching very, very closely. Of course, you're telling Boeing that quality is job one, safety quality is job one. Uh, but if you're, especially if you're like a Southwest or a Ryanair, where you're a pure fleet, right, you, you really can't afford your most important supplier to have problems like this. So uh, I think you're quietly coaching them to improve things, hoping for better, but you're probably biting your nails a little bit, right, because if there's, uh, it continues to be serious problems. Uh, you, you're not switching to Airbus, uh, you know, overnight. And I, I don't know that those people are considering it. I'm not saying that they are, uh, but you got to be concerned. You got to be watching very closely. Does the cash burn that they're looking at for the first quarter would that? I guess the answer is no. But I'm just wondering if they wind up buying Spirit, what, what that does to their cash burn. Like, they look optimistic about getting back to their ramp rate of 38 per month by the end of the year, but what if they buy Spirit? Doesn't that get worse? Doesn't their cash burn get worse? Well, I mean, so I, I guess to some degree, there's, a, there's some things that end up getting hidden when you start buying Spirit, right? Because there's no, if Spirit's showing a loss because they're selling a oh, fuselage true. to Boeing at a loss, you know, Boeing is getting some excess out of that, that whole thing washes out. Um, so you can't always say just because they're pulling Spirit in, it's going to be it's going to be a loss. It depends how they structure that whole thing too, right? If they hive off the Airbus businesses, we think some of those are loss making. That could make things better. 
I think it's I think it's really really uh, hard to tell. But for sure, there'll be a lot of work down at Spirit to make sure they stabilize the production at Spirit, and that's not going to help cash burn either. But I'd assume Brian had that built into his his assumptions. George, let's let's talk about the other half of your research coverage, which is the airlines themselves. Um, I just flew Newark to San, uh, Salt Lake City, seven thirty seven Max eight fully packed to the gills both ways. What's How are the airlines doing these days? Yeah, so in one queue, I think a bunch of them are, st- are gonna show losses. So they, they're filling airplanes because I think the <laughs> revenue managers never let airplanes go down the runway with almost, you know, being entirely full. Uh, but everything, what counts is, you know, the most is gonna be the ticket prices. And, you know, when we looked at 4Q, as we closed out of 4Q, the biggest challenge to, to the higher revenue that they were bringing in was all about these higher pilot salaries, right? They gave a bunch uh, away to the pilots. And so while we're all paying more for the ticket, the pilot's getting more in the front seat. He, they probably deserve it. They work pretty hard. Um, I want and, my pilots so, to be happy. <laughs> True story. You, you do, actually. So pr- profitability is still challenged compared to what we saw uh, last decade. I think fares would have to go even higher, and we've seen them softening a bit. This summer could be a little bit better for the airlines if you know if we have a bunch of Airbus A320s out of the market because of the geared turbofan problems, if Boeing deliveries are slowing down capacity gains in the marketplace, it could be a little bit better, but we're not looking at an environment where we think they're gonna see 2019 levels of profitability, not 2019, you know, even last decade levels of profitability this summer. So I'd say profit's still a little bit weak as the airlines recover. Uh, I think there might be just too much capacity in the marketplace to get but them back to what they they're cutting, right? Last decade. Like, didn't JetBlue announce they're going to cut capacity? They're getting out of certain markets and stuff? Like, I mean, it feels like the capacity cuts are underway. Well, there's a lot of discussion at the airlines about how to optimize schedules to, pr- to try to improve fares. Uh, like you said, uh, airlines like JetBlue, Spirit, pushing back some of their uh, new deliveries as they manage balance sheets a little better and think about, you know, their, their financial health. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that all signals are rosy inside that market. I think they're, especially on the low cost budget side, I think there's probably too much seat capacity in the, in the, in the budget world uh, and, and folks have to think about how they could fix that in order to get better fares and improve profitability. Mm. I have a question. Why do some of my business class tickets I have, sometimes I have a TV on the back and sometimes I don't <laughs> and it gets really confusing. Uh, why is this, George? <laughs> You know, um, it's all about how, you know, the airplane they're using, how it's been outfitted. Sometimes it's, a, it's a, on length of haul and, and how important the market is, right? I've had overnight flights that come out of, out of San Diego where I can't even get a live flat seat on and I'm in business class. You come out of LA, you get a live flat seat because competition's a lot more intense than it. It depends about competition in those marketplaces. It's about airlines using older equipment. But there is even a school uh, out there that says, why bother putting a screen behind any seat anymore? Because everybody gets on the airplane with an iPad or an iPhone, will stream them their content, save all those electronics behind the seat, save all that weight. Maybe it's a better world. Sounds like you vote no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's I mean, a good point. Yeah, yeah you, but you it's just it. not consistent, so it makes me scratch my head. So going to Houston, I've been back, back yeah. and forth in the last couple weeks, TV, super nice hours. plane, yep all good coming back both times i'm like oh okay Okay. this is an old plane isn't it and like you don't have a tv so you blame george ferguson i see what's happening i mean right george ferguson thank you very much you can go back to work here george ferguson aerospace (laughs) airlines annals you're listening to the bloomberg intelligence podcast catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m eastern on apple carplay and android auto with the bloomberg business app you can also listen live on amazon alexa from our flagship new york station just say alexa play bloomberg 1130. looking at the shares of caring uh that's the owner of a bunch of luxury good manufacturers most notably uh, Gucci. And if you're looking for a good book and a good movie, The House of Gucci uh, is awesome. Uh, and it really gives you a good sense of what's happening there in that world. But boy, the stock's down 13% here today. Uh, I need to figure out why. So I go to one person, one person only. That's Deb Aiken. She's a senior retail analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, covering the luxury space amongst others. Uh, but I think her real f- uh, forte is the luxury space. She's got a really good sense of what's going on out there at Bloomberg Intelligence in London. So Deb, uh, Caring, this is a big company. It's got a $45 billion market cap stock, but it's really taking it on the chin today. What did the company uh, announce and, and, and what's going on with our friends at Gucci? 
Right. Hi. Uh, so it was a prelim um, on Q1 uh, uh, in the knowledge that uh, Gucci was uh, by far weaker than the market had expected, uh, particularly out of Asia. So the idea here, um, they guided 10% for Curry No For All in the 1Q. Uh, this whole um, group will start reporting mid-April. And then for Gucci in particular, they expect it to be down um, around 20%. Wow. Now, um, what that does, Gucci into these numbers was 50% of sales and a much higher contributor to profitability and cash flow. Uh, we already know that the whole sector is up against uh, very high comps, uh, okay. including, uh, but, but not actually Gucci, because we know that it's been going through almost two years of transition. Um, but the brand the, the underlying uh, product that's behind the brand while it transitions to a new creative director is just not resonating out in Asia or is not being backed perhaps in the way that it should with hey, investment and direct advertising. Deb, how much of it is also that Gucci in some ways I appreciate it's not cheap, but it became like an aspirational thing for young people. And if that's the area of consumer that's also getting hit, like it's not Hermes, right? Like it's not like insane high end. They're trying to be sort of cooler. They're trying to get that aspirational buyer. Is that a mistake? So the, the idea actually with Gucci is that that's where they ended up um, after three years of 30 to 40 percent of, of sales um, and into so many categories and their brand. Um, it reminds me of something that happened a few years ago also with Burberry. So their brand became more of a fashion um, focused brand. Uh, a lot of A-listers in the younger generation, um, a lot of products that were kind of niche in their, in their product portfolio, um, and it lost uh, what I would class as the exclusivity, the high end, mm. um, the level of production that is expected for, for one of the names you've given at the very high end. And what it's actually tried to do over the last two years is to elevate luxury and uh, identity and it's failed on that so it has a new creative director in place products are just in from mid-february but only in ready to wear which is 15 percent of the business there and it needs the rest of the year to roll that out and in the meantime particularly in asia um, it's very much a wholesale backed market where those wholesale accounts aren't willing to take the risk on inventory which could become very quickly obsolete from the prior uh, creative director and separately where the new creative director is not yet tested. So, Deb, I know from talking to you in the past and reading your research, the Asian uh, consumer is so key. The Asian market is so key, uh, particularly China. What do we hear? Because I don't see the Chinese shoppers on Fifth Avenue. I'm not sure if you see them on the high streets in London. Oh, there's but there's nothing. There's French people now on Fifth Avenue. That's all I see. Europeans are <laughs> everywhere here, which is great. They're always welcome in New York. Um, but I don't see the 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 Asian uh, shoppers. So talk to us about China. What that means for luxury. So uh, what's happening at the moment, uh, there's a lot of domestic spend and that is certainly what's propping up in positive comments. After these results, we went through searching as a reminder what was said by Hermes, by Cushinelli, by Prada and others um, and we'll certainly pop some of that information out there. Um, but overall, when you think about the Chinese consumer, uh, the numbers for the um, the Chinese consumer or Asia overall is still only about 80% recovered where it was. Chinese consumer is shopping on the mainland, excuse me, <laughs> <coughs> shopping, on, shopping on the mainland. Um, but also I was hearing from one of our colleagues, um, Thailand is very, very popular right now because of price sensitivity. They can get a very good break over there. Uh, Hong Kong, you only have a seven day um, permit to, to stay um, from the Chinese um, mainland and so therefore others are becoming more popular like traveling to Singapore where you have 30 day visa free mm. so there is movement around but it's just not really long haul yet and we weren't expecting that until the second half of the year with what's happening with real estate and other we're kind of pushing that into end of the year 2025. So uh, clearly this news is driving down most luxury stocks today all luxury stocks today which one shouldn't be beaten up? Um, if I look at uh, 
the end of 2023. Uh, now, first of all, I should highlight half 124. We came into this year saying it was very much going to be a tale of two halves. And that's not on a big pickup in the market per se, but it's on the fact that the first half comps are particularly heavy versus the second half. Even for Hermes, you're looking at almost 30% growth in the first half and half of that in the second half. So they're up against big comps. But what doesn't get beaten up? It's the very high end of the hierarchy. So generally, it's Hermes. It's uh, also Prada should do very well. Um, it's Cuccinelli. It's within the LVMH portfolio. There are some brands which they really pick out. Louis Vuitton, Dior and others, which mm. should still hold well. Good to know. Um, I, but I, even, I, I even within... Understand. And Cuccinelli. I mean, I know that they're really oh, nice. And it's really expensive, and they're pretty. But it's like for, it's like suits and stuff. It's oh. like regular clothes. Like it's not. I don't get it. But, right. You know. What What is I, the Cuccinelli call? It, I think with with the Cuccinelli side, it's it's about the quality and what it offers. The fact that um, the product is there with longevity, very well made. So it's a piece that you can put in your wardrobe. A lot of it is not seasonal. Um, so you're buying a piece for uh, an event or the office or so, and it's something that you can regularly use. How is the uh, luxury shopping? I know it's part of your due diligence. You, you'll go around to some of the luxury stores in London. How, 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 are, how are things in London and maybe even Paris and the other places you go? Yeah, and I would say uh, quite mixed, actually. Um, you see um, more of the high ends where they're in there and really being highly serviced. Um, and not so many, not so many bags on the high street. Uh, we are still seeing um, decent numbers in terms of e-commerce growth, um, but there are there are very high end product. There's very high end product out there in bags. If you're in particular stores, but then you're only in selective stores where the brand is is um, stocked, and so it is quite mixed out there in, in major cities. Okay, Deb, thanks so much for joining us. As always, Deb Aiken, she covers all the retailers, including the luxury names um, for Bloomberg Intelligence uh, based in London. Again, Caring Stock, uh, owner of several luxury brands, including Gucci, uh, down about 13% here today. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, Tune in and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.